Good afternoon. My name is Elena Van Engelen. I'm a software engineer at EDSN, which stands for Energy um, Data Services Nederland. Energy, very relevant at the moment. Um, actually, I only worked at Dutch companies since I've moved to the Netherlands, coincidentally. So I started as a Java developer at KPN, and then I've realized um, at Bold.com that Kotlin's so much better. I'm sure I'm not offending anybody. This is Kotlin Dev Day. So <laughs> and then um, at PostNL, I, I saw the power of serverless clouds. And actually, I think Kotlin is perfect for that. So that's why today I'm going to be talking about Kotlin on Service Cloud, AWS Lambda Unlimited. So what is serverless cloud? Uh, how many of you have actually used the service cloud on production? Please raise your hand. Hmm, I think 50%. And of those that use the serverless cloud, how many of you use the JVM language on there? Okay, so it will be a little bit familiar, the problems I'll be talking about. Um, okay, so I'm not going to go into much detail about the service cloud because this is not talk about that. So uh, basically, service cloud means that you... Um, you, uh, it's resource, resources on this used basis. So if you have um, traffic to your application, you have resources that will handle your traffic. If there's no traffic, you will scale down to zero, which is nice. Saving energy, not, not, not spilling any resources. Um, and also, you don't have any infrastructure management. Well, what I mean by no infrastructure management, you don't have to patch your service or upgrade your operating systems and so forth. You do need to configure your infrastructure, what you're going to use, actually. OK, so um, today I was going to talk about the AWS Lambda, which is the serverless compute cloud, um, a very good example of serverless. Um, this is actually a function as a service. Um, and what, uh, how does that actually look um, function as a service? If I have some business logic, my application is running, I'm selling some products. Um, and I have a Black Friday, so requests are coming in, everyone wants to buy some nice um, sale. Um, so then my, um, my function will be scaling up. As soon as the sale has gone down, everyone's run out of money, and it, or it's night time or something. So there's no requests, I'm going to scale down to zero. And then I decided to sell a PlayStation 6. Um, so everyone's gone crazy, they all want to buy it, so then again I will scale up to handle all the requests in parallel. So what happens actually, when I scale up, uh, my functions will have to start up. So with serverless, it, it, that's the difference basically when you uh, think about writing a code for serverless as opposed to container-based, you also need to think about your startup time. And that's the part that we're going to be also talking about in today. <clears throat> So first, we're going to create an example application. So we want to compare. And what we want to compare is actually uh, four different functions on different Kotlin runtimes and different AWS Lambda allo memory allocation. Memory allocation is important when you're doing um, multi-threading or concurrency. Oh, yeah, and basically, it's, it's, very, it's important anyway. So um, OK. so. Um, there's no point in comparing Hello World, so we're not going to create that. So there's no, yeah, it's not going to give us any good results. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an application that has I/O and concurrency, and what we're going to create is actually an application that does a parallel scan of a DynamoDB NoSQL database. I will talk a little bit more about the parallel scan once I get to the code. Uh, so for now, uh, I'm not going to go into that, but basically it's I/O and uh, concurrency. So, which Kotlin runtimes are we going to try? <laughs> so, now obviously Kotlin on JVM, that's an obvious choice. It's really easy to create. Um, and then, <laughs> we're going to uh, tune our Kotlin JVM to use C1 compiler optimization. This is an optimization for cold start or startup. I will talk about that a bit later. And then we're going to go native, but we're going to go native on GraalVM. So the reason we're going to choose for GraalVM instead of the LLVM based is because uh, we have a lot of libraries that we want to use and we want to develop fast. So AWS SDK latest versions support this. 
Um, you also have some libraries that also frameworks that also support this, like Spring Native, Micronaut, Quarkus. So we're going to go for that. And we're going to do Kotlin on JS. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the startup time and also the execution time. This is also important um, if you want overall performance of your application. So we're going to create Lambda in Kotlin. We're going to build it with Gradle using Kotlin DSL. And we're going to uh, create infrastructure as code also in Kotlin using a cloud development kit. So everything's Kotlin. I love that. Um, and the parallel scan. So what, what is actually the parallel scan? Uh, so basically, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to scan the database. It's not always the best practice, but there are some use cases where you need that. Um, so basically, you want to read all the data in your table. So in order to do it fast and not to block any other applications from reading your data, you want to do a parallel scan with a page size. So basically, what we're going to do, we separate our table or data basically into segments. And every segment is going to be read by in parallel, and we're going to use core routines for that. So this is what the code looks like. I hope you can read it, because last time I couldn't read the code from uh, the previous talk because of the, uh, yeah, where it was. So basically, uh, what we're doing is on line 20, we're going to look at how many uh, segments we want to separate in, and then we're going to create go routines on line 21, and then we're going to scan where on line 24, we actually say which segment we're scanning. That's we're, we're using uh, AWS SDK, which needs uh, that information in order to actually separate the data. And then total segments, how many in total, and the limit of the page size. And at the bottom on line 32, we're going to get the results of all of the parallel scans. So pretty simple. Um, and then what we need to do in order to call our business logic, we need to wire it up to a handler. So yeah, basically, we're just going to call our business logic from the handler. Um, and after that, we need to package and deploy our application and configure it. So let's have a look at that. <coughs> First, we're going to do the Java, uh, the Kotlin on the JVM, sorry. Um, so in Gradle, uh, we're going to specify that we are using the latest, latest version of Kotlin on JVM, specifying some SDK libraries, AWS SDK, and we're going to package it into a zip file. Um, and after that, what we need to do is configure our, our function. Um, and we're going to do that using Kotlin. So what we're saying here is um, on line 18, we're saying this is our handler, basically the, the location of our handler. And then we're saying we're going to run on JVM. Um, AWS Lambda currently provides a latest version as in Java 11. but because we're using Kotlin, we can just run on the latest version. We are also going to run on ARM64 architecture. So now we're going to, we can deploy our Lambda. All we need to do is just do CDK deploy in our favorite CI CD pipeline or from command line, not recommended. And then uh, we can see in our console that we deployed on JVM on ARM64. So one Lambda is deployed. Next. Um, so now we want to say, OK, well, uh, actually, if we have spiky load, um, maybe it's better to um, improve our startup time. So what's happening here is basically when we uh, compile our code, uh, at basically at startup, that's the cold start, part of the cold start, um, it's actually going through a tiered compilation. So you have a level zero interpreter, and then you have level one, which is um, the first stage of compilation. And this is where we want to stop. And that's because um, level 2 and level 3 adds some profiling, which is a bit of an overhead. And level, uh, and level 4, it's, a, it's basically a C2 compiler, which is a server-side compiler. You only see the benefits of that if you run with stable load for a long period of time. Usually, the default starts from 10,000 calls. So you don't have any call start. You're running constantly. And that's the time where you will see the benefits of that. So for our spiky load, we're going to say, OK, ooh. <laughs> OK, we don't need that. So we're going to use C1 compiler and see how we perform with that. So it's only one setting in our infrastructure, which we already created for the first version. Um, and it will reduce our startup time. So this is the. Uh, actual setting that we need to do, all we need to do is just say that we uh, want to stop at level 
one, and that's on line 24. So let's deploy again, same thing, different Lambda name. And then we can see in the code console that our uh, parameter is, or our environment variable is actually visible in the console. If we execute, we will also see it in the logs that it would, uh, the setting has been picked up. Okay, so now let's go native. What do we need to do to our code to actually deploy this on GraalVM? Well, first, let's have a look what, that, what does actually GraalVM do. It's ahead of time co compilation instead of just in time compilation, which means that we only include reachable code. This is great for security. We don't include all the stuff we don't need. And, but uh, it does have a side effect, and that's basically reflection. So if you're using any libraries that don't out of the box support GraalVM, uh, some reflection parts which you actually use in your code um, uh, won't work without some help. So what we need to do is provide some metadata. You can generate metadata with a tracing agent. You can also reuse metadata. There are some open source um, GitHub uh, repositories with that. Or you can actually create, for the libraries that you often use, you can create your own metadata or generate it and then share it. Or you can use a supporting framework. And there are now three supporting frameworks production ready, Micronaut, Quarks, and Spring Native. And they provide some annotations. So instead of metadata, you can do that. For our example, we're not going to do that because otherwise we will pollute comparison. Um, and therefore, we're going to add some metadata. This is an example. So the example of metadata, I needed to edit this to get coroutines working. So only this I needed to add for coroutines. Um, but this th you can actually, actually generate uh, for all the things that you're actually using when you're running the code. So now let's deploy our Lambda. So what we need to do is um, the out-of-the-box runtimes for uh, AWS actually don't support uh, native. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to provide it a runtime. All we need to say is provided runtime and we give it a Docker image. I'm actually using an open source Docker image for GraalVM and ARM64, but you could also use your own if you want. So again, running on ARM64, I love that one. Uh, um, and now let's deploy. Same thing, CDK deploy from our favorite CI-CD pipeline. And then what we can see is uh, basically we are running on the custom runtime now instead of the Java runtime. And finally, Let's uh, do the Kotlin.js version. So obviously this one is a little bit different from the other three in terms of code because we can't use the AWS SDK we used before for JVM. We, we, we can use the AWS SDK for JS. Um, there is actually a Kotlin AWS SDK that uh, they are brewing, <laughs> which, which will be available for JS and native on LV, LV, L, LVM. But uh, it's not available now, so let's not uh, go in there at the moment. Let's just use the ones that are ready for production. So this is actually AWS SDK for JS, and for that we need to generate externals. Any JS libraries that you want to use from your Kotlin code, you need to actually generate externals so it knows what, um, uh, yeah, basically the, the methods that you want to call and the signature. Um, so this is what we needed to add for um, the DynamoDB uh, SDK, basically just um, the definition of the function that I'm going to call. So let's deploy this and build this. First, the building is different because we want to actually say that it's not JVM but JS. Again, the latest version and the libraries are uh, JS, the uh, AWS SDK libraries are JS instead of um, the JVM version. And when we deploy on our uh, infrastructure as code. Again, very, very similar actually, but almost the same as the JVM one, only we're using the Node.js uh, runtime instead. So let's deploy again. Not going <laughs> to go into it's the same actually. And we can see in the console that we're now running on Node.js. So which one has the fastest cool start? Let's wake you up a little bit. So those that think it's going to be Kotlin on JVM, please raise your hand. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, okay, so Kotlin JVM C1. Who thinks that's the fastest call start? Nope, no takers. Kotlin native GraalVM. Yeah, that's better. And who thinks JS will be the winner? Oh, there's still some takers. All right, well, let's have a look at the results. Actually, it's a GraalVM native that's the winner. 
Uh, you can see the JVM uh, actually um, is the slowest, and then the C1 improves 40%. But you only need to be as fast as, as you need to be. So the performance is dependent on, you don't have to always improve it unless you're actually worried about your P95s and P99. So um, let's have a look at the JS and the native together to see, is there a big difference? Actually, there is. Because if you look at the milliseconds, for example, on the memory size 2000 MB, you can see that there's 700 difference in milliseconds. That's quite a lot. So um, that means that actually uh, Kotlin Native is, is a big winner on the gold start. So now I'm going to make it a bit more difficult. Which one has the slowest average execution? So after the gold start, we're warm, we're executing. Which one do you think is the slowest? Is it Kotlin JVM? Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, JVM C1? JS? Yeah, and Kotlin Native. Okay, so the results are in, and actually Kotlin Native here is also a complete winner. Um, it depends also on the memory size. What happens is with memory size that you're not only increasing memory, but you're also increasing CPU power. And from 3000 MB, you actually add a CPU. So from two to three. So when you're doing multi-threading, it can make a difference in your application. We actually done some tests on production at PostNL with a lot of a lot of events, and uh, we found that actually the JS and uh, JVM C1 will start losing to JVM if you run in a constant uh, load. So what should we use actually? Kotlin JVM, well, actually, it's really easy to, and quick to develop. So if you're not worried about your P95 and you're running asynchronous uh, frequent load, just use that. It's, it's, you know, everyone's going about cold start, but cold start is not really relevant if you look at the whole uh, execution time, because if you execute for a long time, it will start um, catching up and winning from other um, JS, for example. Um, JVM C1. Uh, well, actually, if you always have cold starts, for example, cron jobs, or you have frequent cold starts because of you, you don't have um, a lot of traffic, this is a good option. So like, let, let's say I have a cron job that runs once an hour, this is brilliant. Um, but if you're worried about your P95, P99, you have users waiting for response, go native. This is really going to make a difference in your performance. Um, it's only a bit more work. You have to get used to the way to work with it. Um, and also the advantage is you can just go from JVM and upgrade it and deploy it to uh, GoLVM. JS, where should I use that? Well, actually, there's a, a, a Lambda uh, at Edge, which is a special kind of Lambda that's executing on Edge locations uh, closer to the users. And it has a lot of limitations. And limitations uh, include runtime. And you can only run Python or a Node.js on it. So if you want to use Kotlin everywhere, which I do, you can just do this. So Kotlin on AWS Lambda Unlimited, that's why I think it's unlimited there. Beat the cold start by going native. Um, run faster on ARM64. You can just run ARM64 on all the architectures. CDK infrastructure as code in Kotlin. Um, uh, building your own Kotlin uh, in in, in um, Kotlin DSL with Gradle, well, everybody knows that. Um, and you can actually deploy on Lambda at Edge as well in Kotlin. And you run the latest version, which actually, for me, is the winner also against um, the Java variant, for example. Because there you actually are tied to uh, the, the release of AWS, what they're releasing on the runtime. So if you think of any comments or questions, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I have some... Um, some QR codes. Uh, the examples are also available on GitHub. Uh, but if you have questions now, do you have time? OK, yeah. Plenty of time. Oh, nice. Is there anybody with questions? Yes, the, the question is uh, uh, with the native image, you said that we need to provide a Docker image ourselves. So then uh, I guess the point of uh, so, so you, you need to you need to take care of the Docker image that you're running on. So you need to patch it and uh, right. Um, yeah. So with the Docker image, um, well, you need to make sure that you have the latest version of RAL VM there. And for example, you can use the, your latest version of JVM because you're not 
uh, affected by Amazon anymore. But yeah, if I if I do that, I do the Gradle upgrades anyway. So you're yeah, you're not really yeah. There are not many lines of code. You can have a look at that um, um, Docker image that um, I used on um, on open source. Not many lines of code, but yeah, you have to make sure you upgrade. But it's the same with um, Gradle. Yeah, it's the same. Way, basically, the same as if you upgrade your Kotlin to the next version, or your JVM to the next version. I'm in my uh, uh, variant. I'm using uh, uh, Java 17 instead of 11 because obviously I'm not restricted by AWS. So yeah, you do need to maintain that Docker image. It's not very many lines of the code. I think it's about 10 or something. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, you said that we don't always need to worry about cold start times. Like, if if we're not if we're not strictly worried about the performance, we don't always have to worry about that. But then, if we're not worried about cold start times, because, for example, we have a long running uh, process, then at that point, isn't it more advantageous to have a, um, a permanent containers instead of using Lambda? using some yes, other... Yes, you, you could use um, also Fargate that's also serverless, so in a container you could use that. But um, basically if you have an asynchronous process and basically you're handling um, events that are coming in, and because it's asynchronous there's no users waiting. So even if you have a peaky load, so this is really, uh, serverless is really great for peaky load because you can scale down to zero. Those cold starts in the morning, yeah, they don't matter. Nobody's waiting for that. And if you if you run the whole day, um, you basically you catch up really quickly to all other run times that are actually not as fast. And then at night it goes down to zero again, so you're not wasting any energy and money. Um, so uh, yeah, you you'd have to if you, if you have constant load that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then you're probably better with Fargate. Thank you. Um, I've, I said I haven't experienced with crawl VM yet. I'm gonna do it very soon. <laughs> I've heard that there is it's not free, right? So what is uh, the additional cost involved with it? Uh, well, I'm using using the free version. You have two versions: the um, yeah, the, the 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 enterprise version where you have to pay for it, um, and the free version. I have never used the enterprise version. Um, you you can yeah. So. Um, I didn't really need to, but I think if you're using a large scale and uh, yeah, I think the paid version has extra features like debugging, it's got extra performance thing, things if you need to. Um, uh, you can also profile in, the, in there to see if you can improve performance, but for our use cases, actually performance was so much better, we didn't need any of that. So uh, yeah, it was free for us, but um, obviously, yeah, you'd have to check the pricing. I don't know it from my head. Oh, uh, what is? Any more questions? If not, then I would like to thank you, Elena, for your nice talk. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> of course.